good day. Welcome to episode 100 100. of the Sports Medicine Project. (laughs) Thank you very much for joining us. Boy and girls, do we have a big episode coming for you today. Two huge guests, huge guests, return guests of the show. They've been around since the beginning. They were there at the creation of the Sports Medicine Project the week they got COVID. They come up with this idea of having a podcast. I have my very knowledgeable co-host, Kelly Cortick. And I have my knowledgeable co-host, my favorite podiatrist, some may say. Oh, big call. Blake Withers, mm. podiatrist, clinical educator, lecturer, presenter, <laughs> influencer. He's here yeah, in the yeah. house. <laughs> I did. I have done some influencing, not for not for uh, good educational content, but certainly for shoes. Someone uh, messaged me through the podcast and actually asked me about a pair of shoes that I posted, and I'm pretty certain they did buy them. So that is one person influence. So I guess I do fit the uh, yeah. I think you the fit the influencer role. Yeah. I reckon. Yeah, yeah, very good. So episode one hundred. Mm, I'm this is keen it. to talk about some stuff today. Yeah. I've been I've been inspired over the last week of my learnings and um yeah. Mm, I'll and do you one better. I've been inspired the last two years we've been doing this podcast for. Yeah, we have learned a lot, hey. Four four days worth apparently. Yeah, so we've four done days if we, if we say an hour on average and pff, who are we kidding? We have definitely done more than an hour per podcast. I mean, when we reach out to the guests you know, we, we call it the knowledge hour on the uh, on the booking page and we say that it's going to be an hour, but it usually never is an hour. The time I stuff up the question or the intro or I ask a question and it turns into a 20-minute story before the actual question comes. So it ends up being like an hour and a half. But let's say an average per hour per episode, 100 hours divided by 24, it's about 4.1 days straight. Nice. That's a lot of time sitting in front of this mic speaking to people about feet and pain and menstrual cycles and morning erections and footwear crazy that's the stuff that i remember that just come to mind they're the things that spring to mind yeah what about bones and tendons yeah bones and tendons things? yeah they're as important as erections i guess but <laughs> no they are pretty cool but just to, to think that we have been able to connect with some of these people and if you're listening to this and you've been here from the start or from the middle or you've only just come on we can't thank you enough. I mean, it, it's been slowly progressing and I think the people that have been listening and the information and the feedback that we get, it just, it motivates us every time to want to get another guest on or for us to learn more and want to bring you this education and it's free. Like having this healthcare or this access to healthcare information shouldn't cost. Like it's awesome that we can do that. And it's just so great to generate such stimulating conversation with people. Like, oh, I'm so stimulated. I think about the conversations that I've had with people, say, on Instagram or social media platforms that I, I would not know you if this podcast didn't exist. Like, I just don't think we would have had that opportunity oh. to connect with people and have the conversations that we do and grow as clinicians as we have, which is just so great. So thank you for yeah. all of that. Yeah. I was talking to, uh, to, to Bo Chill from Sydney. That's the person I had my <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, go and check out his. He's got uh, Doso Instagram page, Bo, the physio, and Stress Fracture Physio. And he was telling me that one of the the motivations for him wanting to learn more about bones was when he listened to the podcast with Dr. Rich Willie. And that was a while ago. And he creates lots of good content. He shares now lots he's of research. A stress Fracture Man. Yeah. And to think that or be in a small role to play some role in that. I mean, it's just awesome. And he's just an awesome bloke as well. I mean, yeah. uh, we, funnily enough, a couple of weeks ago, him and I were just chatting as, as we do about bone stretch injuries. And I was like, oh, what are, what are you doing tonight? This is about 9.30. He goes, oh, not much. And I was like, oh, you want to just jump on Zoom and chat for an hour? And we did chat for about an hour to an hour and a half, just going back and forth talking about bone stress injuries and MRIs. and she I just got, recorded it as an episode. Yeah, I was thinking that. We were talking some, some yeah, some, some awesome stuff. And I'm like, hey, what do you think of this idea? And I'm draw, I was drawing on the whiteboard in the background of my room. And yeah, to, to be able to do that is, is awesome. And putting your ideas out to have them critiqued is awesome because you know the people that are critiquing them are doing it in the way in which is only going to make everyone feel better and grow better. Mm. So you can have these awesome conversations and basically be wrong and not feel bad about it because you've learned from it. And I think having that space is awesome. 
Mm, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Only problem is after that bloody episode that I... Oh, not episode we did with Bo, but when I was looking on the Zoom, I was in this position, what would you call it? Forward neck lean. And I woke up... That was when I woke up with the right That's neck. That's how it started. And, and the then neck was gone. the last two weeks, you've just I've had been, a cooked I've neck. been down, been down bad. Yeah, I've been real <laughs> been stiff. Been having to do... Um, Bit of manual, bit bit of manual, manual therapy, therapy, PAs and all this I mean, stuff. fixing my posture and everything. It I'm going to book him in. I'm going to book Blake in with one of the physios at the clinic, I think. I think he needs some real real treatment. Yeah, we spoke about that. I just don't think I would be a, a good patient. Yeah. I think that I would go and I would just ask lots of questions and then I don't do know if I would come back. Yeah, I think I would do something, but I would want the fix. I'm like, just fix it, man. Fix the facet. Because in the lower limb, it's different to the upper limb. Lower limb's like a bit taking easier. The medication, hey? Yeah, just I'd... go straight to the end. <laughs> okay, bang, just cortisone me now, PRP in the back. <laughs> but uh, I would like to get a scan just to see what it looks like, just to see how degenerated it is. See how many discs are bulging. Oh, I reckon I, if I saw that, I'd be. If I You're... saw that there was a bit of degeneration, I'd go and get me in, book me in now. Nah, I'm gonna sign I up for private health. Yeah, I mean you've just got a pretty cooked knee, and you've seen the MRI for that, and that doesn't seem to phase you too much. So yeah, I don't think, I think it would bother you too much. Yeah, I think I'd be alright as long if I saw something wrong. As long as someone got up a whiteboard and just drew the peripheral nerve and told me about hypersensitization, I'd be sweet. <laughs> hypersensitization. <laughs> um, hypersensitivity. Hypersensitization. I've been reading too many, too many fucking reading research papers about pain lately <laughs> peripheral sensitization was a thing i'm thinking about but uh but anyway i've got a question for you yeah 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 so on friday i attended the women in sports congress which was mm. awesome and we're on international talk about women's that day on international mm-hmm. women's day yeah which we're going to talk about in a second i'm just gonna um rehash a few of my highlights from the day mm. but i wanted to ask you a question it's something that i was thinking about throughout throughout the congress and i had a few conversations with some of the women there because the the group of people that were there was probably 85 to 90% women. Mm. And we were sort of saying, look, a lot of what probably needs to happen is there probably needs to be more men in this room to try and share the the love around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I personally find that I ebb and flow between feeling like I'm a bit of like a raging feminist when I try and have conversations or educate people Mm. on women's problems and the you know the gaps in Mm. research and things like that but I also think it needs to be discussed and I want to know from your point of view sorry I've just kind of thrown you in the deep end here but I want to know from your point of view like what is what do you think would be the preferred way to learn about women's health and the gaps in research and where you know Mm. things need to go to support women's sport that doesn't make you feel like you've got like a wall up because it makes me feel like I'm a raging feminist or do you not Mm. care about that? Like what do you, what are your thoughts? Cause I know that it definitely affects a lot of men. Like I think a lot of men look at women and they're just like, Oh fuck, like here we go again. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's our big announcement. We're not talking about healthcare anymore. We're going straight into politics. We're going to talk (laughs) politics. We're going to talk, should there be a social welfare, that kind of stuff. Should there be women's rights? That's what we're going to start talking about. No, I, I doesn't, doesn't really, I don't feel like I have a wall up with any of that stuff. I, I find it really interesting, mm. but I completely understand that people don't find it interesting. I think it's great that there's been lots of funding and lots of energy put into, I guess, generating any kind of maybe media or, hmm, I guess you could say media around women's sport and women's research. I think a lot of these things will just take time for, for it to grow. Like I know a really interesting podcast that I like to listen to is, is Sam Harris's Making Sense podcast. And someone did an analysis on that. It's a really popular podcast. Someone did an analysis on, I think he's maybe got 200 episodes and they looked at how many of those, and he interviews people like, you know, Elon Musk and really smart intellectual people. And I think there was only maybe 6.9% of all the guests on there had been female or something mm-hmm. like that. So, but he'd started that a, a long time ago. And I think potentially in those positions, there are more men because that's been the history. Mm-hmm. And I think it is changing. I don't, and I'm not able to comment on how that should change and if it's changing quick enough, because I just don't know. But for me personally, just for me, I think it's awesome. And I love to learn about women's bodies and health and how it affects my clinical practice. And anytime any female or, or women woman is doing anything, I'd, 
I don't know. I don't really look at it as if it's male or a female. I mean, you might look at it different. Like if you were to see a female versus a male doing their PhD, I would just look at them the same. I don't really even, gender doesn't even cross my mind. Mm. But potentially you might see the female doing that and I don't know, I don't know, be more excited. I don't, I don't know. What do you think the best way is to approach educating males about it though like even let's step out of the healthcare space and talk about like even just educating people like our dads say or you know like generations that are maybe a little bit older and (laughs) they don't have a great knowledge in the health space like I could so picture your dad being like like make comments about like the women's sport and things like that yeah like, yeah just to, a throwaway yeah, comment just like, like, you know, yeah it's good it's good, it's good but, but it's just, not as they don't, just, they don't need as, as hard yeah yeah, yeah. Same yeah. Thing. like what do you think i'm oh, just interested i don't know but i feel like right now i'm walking in the desert on a minefield <laughs> and someone has like a gun to my head playing russian roulette because i'm trying to think of the words as, as politically it is possible hard though, right? no but like, i i feel it's, it's challenging and that's mm. why i'm kind of putting you in this spot because I find this stuff really interesting and everyone that we were at the, I was at the Congress with, we were talking about this, you know, it's really hard to get these messages across and try and almost get buy-in from the but what, male popu- what, population. What messages are you trying, like, are you trying to get a, are you talking about the conclusions from research or are you trying to get no, females included in research? That and trying to uh, maybe get the message across that like women like girls even youth development needs to be at a volume that's as like that's equal to the men and yes. even from a younger like age group and that that like one of the things i'm going to talk about well i'll talk about it now so oh, wait, the- on that topic i just wanted to to pull you up on that one thing i would add to it is those things just take time. Like you can't have, let's talk about youth development. I mean, you, you just can't have from a point of view of resources and energy mm. and finance, you can't just create, you know, 20 youth female teams to have them move from youth to high level. It just takes a lot of time. So I think there's there's financial considerations, mm. of course, and there's also considerations of people wanting to be involved. And there is no doubt there has been more, males involved in the sport and i guess a lot of the attention has been on male sport for a long time because it just hasn't been female sport like i mean look at the wnrl Mm. that's only been around for a short period of time but it's growing and that can only move in stages i don't know if it can move that much quicker but it can certainly move a lot slower yeah and it's been moving pretty well i do agree with you but someone's got to try and drive that change and i think that that comes from women probably having more of a voice to make these problems more known to the general population and i think the way to approach that is challenging for a lot of women because i don't know that maybe oh, this yeah, is yeah, me yeah. feeling a bit imposter syndrome and maybe other women don't but i i just feel as though that the a lot of the responses from men like even i talk to my dad about some of this stuff like he'll make comments and i'll pull him up on it mm. and it's um it's not well reciprocated. So I don't know, just something that I've been thinking about, but we can move on. Yeah. We're talking about this for a bit. Yeah. Well, let's hit me with some of the, the considerations yes. and we'll go conference mm-hmm. point chat. And then I've got some stuff to talk about. We've got some case study questions that people have sent through on the Instagram, which happens all the time. And every time someone sends one through, I think to myself, before I send back this 10 minute voice message or even talk to them on the phone, we can speak about it and then I can also send that because then I can have it in a longer format and it makes a lot more sense. So we'll go point for for point. What do you reckon? Sounds good? Yeah. So this first one, I'm going to hit you with two to start with because the first one's just a really, oh, maybe it won't be super quick. But Mm. so did you know you can measure muscle fiber type using MRI? Mm Mm-mm. Yeah, so you can measure that. like t- if it's a type 1 or a type 2 fiber or if there's crossover or what the percentage is of type 1 versus type 2 fibers. In a general fibers. MRI? In a general MRI. Do they have to In, do so they die or have to do anything like that? I don't think so, no. And so this was a study done or research that's been conducted up at Griffiths University. Griffith University? Yeah. And so the conversation point that, that we were having around that was it's potentially like a, an option for youth development programs for progressing or enhancing performance. If a sprinter, say, has more type 2 muscle fibers, mm. 
is it worth having mm. a conversation with them that maybe they shouldn't be doing sprinting? Maybe they yeah. should move more towards like 800 meter runs or 1500 meter runs. That's but then tough. also there's outliers in that. And if they really enjoy that sport, then should you be deterring them in a different direction? Or could that just be a way to help coaches sort of guide their training and what they should be doing in the gym? For example, if it is a sprinter and they've got more type two muscle fibers, then maybe they should be doing more things that are going to encourage like type one activity, like more heavy lifting mm. and explosive work to try and drive that. But yeah, I felt that was quite interesting. It is really interesting. Yeah. Is, I know there's been some research showing that you can change from one or the other, albeit only a small amount. I've heard that between uh, they've looked at distance runners early on in their career and followed them over a longer period of time and looked at percentage of muscle fibers yeah. for between type one and type two, and there was a percentage change. But I just remember the highest being quite quite small. When you look at those two different fiber types, is there a correlation between? I know it's logical, but I'm just asking: is there a correlation between performance or injury? So if you're a sprinter and you've got a higher percentage of type one, does that mean you perform? better if you were to say you've got the exact same person with a high percentage type 2 or you're more likely you're injured no i think it's more from like a performance perspective like you're genetically more inclined to be better at sprinting say than endurance events yeah however of course there's other things that influence your ability Mm. to Mm. develop as an athlete yeah but then like if someone's in a youth development program and they've like got strong goals to make it to the Olympics and they're tossing between say like 400 meters or 800 meters and they've yep. got more type two muscle fibers and maybe you could be like, maybe you should go a little bit more down the 800 yeah. meter route type that's, of thing. That's really difficult because it's, it's looking at someone's genetics. I mean, you could say the same thing with VO2 with someone with a high VO2 if you test them early on, which I know they're doing over in in Norway, should mm. those people then look at sports that are shorter duration if they have a higher VO2? Because obviously yeah. there's lots of yeah. other factors that influence what you what you enjoy. That's yeah. interesting. It's, I, it is interesting. It makes me think of the, when it comes to tendons and bones, and I had an awesome chat with, with Darcy Daw last week. That's the other thing about the podcast, being able to connect with awesome people. Mm. I spoke with him for an hour on Zoom, just about plantar heel pain, which was cool, and just talking about structure and what that means for performance and education and injury. And I wonder if we look can look at tendons and bones and look at their structure, potentially not so much early on, but later in life and be able to potentially predict injury or have a higher probability of predicting when someone is going to get injured purely based off the structure. Because we know structure does matter to some degree. We just don't know how to mm. to say that it matters. What do you think? Well, I remember listening to a podcast I don't know if it was one of Brad Beer's ones like ages ago Mm. and I think his question was something along the lines of like how close are we to being able to prevent injuries and the person that they were interviewing was saying well essentially what we need is like a portable MRI machine that you can get instant MRIs of different Mm. bones and just assess whether there's any bony edema that's developing. But then now we know that that's kind of a normal response to Mm. load and you're probably going to see that after a a hard endurance run anyways. So I don't know if that's actually... Like, I wonder if that person would say the same thing, knowing what we know now. Yeah, but it's abnormal. Sorry, it's normal until it's not. Yeah, so I, but you I wonder, don't know until it's no, symptomatic. you don't, but so there has to be... The... I do believe there, there has to be something there, I think. I just think that we don't know what it is because there's obviously some pathological continuum that, that, that happens as we know degenerate or degenerative tendon changes to the cellular matrix all that kind of stuff is Mm. is normal than a tendon and it doesn't mean you're doomed to have tendinopathy but as keith was saying you know potentially dr keith ma one of our episodes i think it was five episodes ago as he was saying potentially if someone had a degenerative portion of their tendon could that down the line further increase their risk of injury because that part's not as tolerable and that might do something to their tendon compared to if they didn't and i wonder if we can be able to maybe screen within your imaging and i think in my my water condition i see a lot of is the plantar fasciitis plantar fasciopathy plantar heel pain and there's been good research to show if you have a plantar fascia that's uh, six mil thickened or more 
it's had an association with plantar fasciopathy. Now, of course, the first thing you think, well, is it just they had plantar fasciopathy first and now they have a thickened plantar fascia or, or vice versa, kind of chicken or the egg. Mm. But does that thickened fascia then increase their risk of injury again and there's something about the structure that, that is the, the reason for that? I don't know because I feel like we've tended to, to move away from imaging as being prognostic or mm. even diagnostic in some mm. parts of the body. So... I don't know how that could... I don't know, maybe. But mm. I, I can't really see that with what we know now, mm. right now. So the other portion to that, and this is what I was speaking to, to, uh, to Darcy about it, and he's been really sp- spending a lot of time learning and, and putting a lot of effort into this, is looking at the, the planter pad and just seeing how well it can absorb force. So yeah. when you put the planter fat pad under stress what happens to it and comparing that between a pathological and a non-pathological side mm. and just seeing the, the difference. So if, what is the plantar pad? Is that just like a fat pad? Yeah, or? plantar fat pad. So to think of it simply, you've got these little, uh, what are they what are They called? Little uh, macro, macro fouls, macro phalges. So you, basically to think of the fat pad, you've got these small cellular wars and then these bigger cellular wars and they are really just like your external cushion. So how well they're able to basically dissipate force when you hit the ground, because when you're sitting there with your heel, you have a high amount of force underneath the heel from the ground reaction plus your body coming down. So how well it is able to dissipate force will th- theoretically reduce the force to the structures underneath, which is the origin of the plantar pl- fascia plus other things. So if you have a plantar fat pad that isn't able to do that as well, potentially the forces are going to be higher in the pad and forces are going to be higher to those structures. So one of the reasons why, you know, heel lifts and soft inner soles and soft mm-hmm. shoes can help is because you have external support. So structurally, if you could identify something from that plantar pad that tells us that it's not able to absorb force, and that could be as simple as you stand on it and you just get an image of how thick it is, mm. does that mean that there's going to be less force underneath? And uh, that really got me thinking, and this is Darcy's uh, thinking, really smart, knowledgeable guy. And uh, yeah, just, just got me thinking. Yeah, so that's another, another structural one because that could mean then if someone's like a, a runner or they spend a lot of time on their feet and that pad just doesn't absorb the force. Maybe they should be in softer shoes. Well, yeah, potentially. Potentially that person might need a soft inner sole forever or mm. they might need a heel lift or a soft shoe or they just need they education. Well, it's not going to adapt, I don't think, as much as, say, uh, like a tendon or a muscle because it's involuntary in a sense that there's different, there's certain structural parameters around that tissue that I think reduce the ceiling on the adaption front. Okay. But still interesting to, uh, to think about. And that could be one of the reasons why plantar heel pain takes a long time. And one of the reasons why a lot of the research says we don't really know what works best. Lots of things work, but I guess yeah. that's for everything. Mm. wanted to ask you about this case so someone sent in a, a question to the instagram about a an injury to a foot quite a unique injury someone had a trauma to the foot they dropped something and this was the the imaging result low grade stress response to the plantar lateral navicular plus stress response to the cuneiform plus a small subchondral sp- stress fracture to the second TMT line. So... Are they a runner? No. So, force acting upon the foot. So, an acute overload. What do you think? What would be the management of that? What are you thinking straight away? So, you've... you've um, this comes to the clinic. You get some imaging. What do you I'd do? I'd send that to a sports doc, honestly. Like, mm. I wouldn't know what to do. If I'm mm. being honest, well, if we, like that's if, that's weird enough for me. Oh, I'd offload them. I'd give them crutches and or a boot and say, "Don't wait there." Yeah. So we sure. break it down. What's the highest risk area in in that? The navicular. Yeah, navicular. Even though it's a low grade one, still a navicular. Poor healing, lateral plantar surface, cuneiform. It's not too bad because the loads aren't as, as high, but the TMT loads are going to be high as you move from mid stance to propulsion. So initial management on the day what would it be obviously saying sports doctor but what would be the initial yeah, management offload, like put them into a boot with crutches and mm. say non-weight bearing until we have more guidance from the sports doctor yeah is pretty much all i do really yeah give them some other like options in terms of exercise things that mm. they can still do swimming upper body work in the gym mm. maybe bike possibly yeah um yeah yeah and is the reason you're saying that is because with a navicular, 
the the research would suggest the healing times are are really quite long Mm. and the percentage of people that have these injuries that end up with surgery is actually a lot higher than anywhere else in the foot and the ankle yeah it's just a bit of a weird diagnosis as well like not something that i would have seen before Mm. to that sort of extent like not a stress response in all of those areas especially after an acute trauma Mm. i would say yeah so it's just not something that i feel particularly comfortable with and i'm happy to just offload that yeah Yeah. i think one of the values of that is you just don't know whether it be sports doctor or even foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon yeah that's the other one yeah sure yeah you just you know i mean you don't know what you don't know i mean they could look at that and you know this depending on going off the report of the imaging but you could look at that and go yeah that, that's fine non-weight bearing and you might not even know it might need a ct or it might need another x-ray from another view and that's where you know foot and ankle ortho or, or sports doc come into consideration image before the consult i'd probably call either the sports doctor or our foot and ankle ortho yeah. and have a chat to them about what they think and see what their thoughts are just initially because yeah. they might be like no nah, that's fine just pop them in a boot for a few weeks and off they go or they might say oh that's a bit weird like yeah i'd like to see them hmm. so that's probably what i would do yeah cool yeah. i uh yeah I, I agree and i think going a bit more aggressive with the non-weight bearing crutches and boot mm what is the risk if then a week later they come off the crutches? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like you've just had a week off. You're not going to have that much deconditioning compared to like, oh, shit, you probably should have been these a bit earlier. Now we have to almost, you know, start yeah. back a, a week before. Yeah, yeah. very sure. good. And yeah. I just wanted to add to that, understanding the risk factors. I mean, this is in a 65-year-old woman with osteopenia, doesn't spend much time on their feet. That's different to a 23-year-old triathlete, you know, who has an event coming up or mm-hmm. a 40-year-old trader that spends a lot of time on their feet. You know, the, the context does matter. Yeah, for cool. sure. For sure. All right, what, uh, what point you got here? So this is just really interesting. It's probably not so relevant clinically for, for me or for, for us, I wouldn't say, but I just found this so fascinating. So the Olympics are coming up in july august time periods six months roughly mm-hmm. and july i think later than that isn't it uh i think maybe the end of july is when mm. they start but okay don't, don't quote yeah, me on it cool. so the surfing is so paris is where the olympics are being held we all know this mm. the surfing event has actually been moved to tahiti there's a particular surf break in tahiti that they have selected for the surfing competition can't remember exactly what the name is but This surf break in Tahiti has been banned for women since 2006 because it's really dangerous. There's been deaths, there's been some really serious injuries. So in 2006, they just decided to say women can't surf this break. And why was that? The reason being is because women can't paddle fast enough to get Mm. onto the wave safely. But three years ago, when they announced that this is a site for the surfing for the Olympics, they've opened up this surf break for women to start practicing which is just so bizarre isn't it Mm. like they've this this surf break hasn't been accessible for women ever or since 2006 and then in the last three years they've just suddenly made it available and so women are having to learn all these new surfing techniques really (laughs) revise their paddling skill and learn uh, that so griffith's university again they've been doing all of these studies to try and increase their sprint paddling speed so that women can get onto the wave safely which is just really fascinating what they've been doing and it'll be they pretty much don't really know what the result is until the olympics come around so it'll be fascinating to watch i'm really excited to watch that sport like I was anyways, but now knowing the context to it, I think is just really, really cool. But it's also just weird. Hey, like if the Paris Olympics, you know, in France, obviously, like why aren't they just choosing a different break? Like why have they decided to go all the way to Tahiti when there's been this wave that hasn't even been available for women to practice on in Mm. such a long time? I just find that so crazy. Yeah, I agree. I've got no idea. I mean, it's such a short period of time for them to go from not being able to do it to being able to do it. And I guess the only way to truly know is to to go out and practice. Can I imagine they'd have the theoretical data of what they need to do? Like you have to hit this degree of power output yeah. to be able to paddle out onto the wave, but mm. that isn't always the same in practice. So you'd have to go out and paddle on the and on like, the wave. And what if someone dies or injured? Sport of surfing, like it's not really a sport where you 
well, I don't think you refine your paddling technique when you're young. Like, you know how swimming, you get really like nitty gritty into your technique and things like that. Mm. I feel like surfing's not a sport where someone's like filming you and saying, no, you need to have this hand entry and, and pull like this and those sorts of things. So, I mean, I could just be guessing. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't just really like, know I feel like surf for surfing is quite a, um, like a family culture based sport, almost like you grow, if you your mum and dad did it, then you did it. Or if your friends did and you lived mm. on the coast, then you did it and you just kind of jumped in and learned. So it's just interesting that there's probably like, there's no data on effective surfing technique or paddling technique on a surfboard. And so they're just having to do all of this extra study now to get these women safely surfing in Tahiti. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I don't really know much about surfing. I just don't see that many, all yeah. the ones that I almost all, it's always sesamoids. That's what I'm seeing oh, really? in every single surfer. And you can't do anything because they're on the board barefoot. They're not going to wear their hocker bond eyes with a cutout deflection when they're on the on the board. Yeah. But obviously you can offload it outside of that. But uh, I see quite a few surfers, but it's more the recreational type and shoulders, surely. Shoulders, yeah, yeah, would be the common one. All low backs or necks is the other. Oh, I would not be good. My my back and my <laughs> neck. I'd be I'd be you'd postured be stiff. out. You'd be stiff. Mm. Yeah, so that's just a really interesting point that I learned. Yeah, that is interesting. It was cool at the Congress, though, just to be having these conversations about all different types of sports. I mean, we, we're we so buried deep in running and endurance sports, so it was really cool to learn about some of those different sports that aren't so commonly talked about. Yeah. 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 I was thinking, I'm going to tell you a story, tell me a story. about a another podcast I listened to that I really, really enjoyed. That's the... Uh, the Inside Running Podcast. I love to listen to them each week and, and hear the guys and girls talk about running, which is cool. But uh, a couple of episodes I've been listening to has been the... It's almost like what I imagine every runner to speak about their injury like in a sense of not making all the mistakes that a runner would, but when I hear them speaking about it, it sounds so logical. So... One of the the guys on there is just struggling with a a, uh, a hip injury, and they were just speaking about the, the management. And they're not not health professionals, but they've got a pretty good idea. They've been running for a while, and speaking about a, a hip injury and a, a lot of the discussion. So basically, pain was stable around a one or two out of ten. Worse with faster activity, and they would just say, you know, you just need to take some time off, just take two weeks off completely, and then start back up running again, or potentially look at getting a cortisone injection for it. And no one had kind of mentioned the diagnosis, potentially a, a bursa. It sounded like a, a glute tendinopathy, but yeah. just knowing to jump, like obviously jumping straight to cortisone is, a, you know, something you don't want to do, especially if it's a tendon. But even if, it, if it's a birth and it's been going on for three weeks, you know, cortisone probably isn't a, is an ideal on the timeline of what would be recommended for, for lateral hip pain. But one question that I, that I thought would be awesome for us to, to talk about is, because we know that there's runners that listen to this that aren't health professionals, is basically when is it safe to continue running and why is it important to continue running when you have an injury? Now, this this question falls on the the assumption that the person that you're seeing or if you are listening to this, you are someone that running means a lot to you and it's very important. So if you're just doing it to, uh, you know, for you know fitness or for health or for mental, you know, benefit and you can easily switch out to something else, well, I guess, you know, that's fine. You can cross train and change. But for someone that really wants to continue running, what do you think? So when is it safe to continue running? And when is it not safe? And when should you stop? Well, I think it needs to be assessed yeah. first because you don't really know what you're dealing with until it's been assessed. Yeah. And let's say we've ruled out bone stress injuries and we are dealing with something like a, a tendon or a burst, like a greater trochanteric bursitis. Yeah. Well, commonly, they do go hand in hand anyway, so mm. you do often get overlap with the two. And, and now that condition is often called greater trochanteric pain syndrome because yeah. you can't really differentiate, differentiate between the two. Yeah. It's, it's, that's not a particular problem that I think needs to be completely pain free. And I, I mm. would be almost encouraging someone if they only had symptoms of a one out of 10 to be continuing to train through it, to avoid a boom and bust cycle that would come from 
a period of complete deloading. Like mm. a week off isn't going to cause that to happen. And then sometimes we need to have, you know, a full week off just to let the body mm. repair if we're feeling quite tired or fatigued. But mm. if the, the reason that we're having the week off is to minimize pain, that's a one out of 10. I don't think you're going to be very successful with that, with that particular condition mm. a lot of the time. Mm. Um, it's one that probably needs to get comfortable with the the loading that you're doing and yes it's it's there for a reason so it's your body saying that you need to dial things back but i don't know that it's a reason to stop completely yeah and it sounds it sounds so logical like stop let it settle down and then start back up again it's back to normal but i guess the the way i have people think about it when i'm seeing them in the clinic is you know finding currently what is the ceiling and the floor like what is the threshold that this particular injury can tolerate and if you're currently running and training and the pain is very stable and it's not fluctuating very much you know you're probably right at that that ceiling if it's a one or a two out of ten and if we think about the particular injury we can usually first line therapy is just trail trail (laughs) we can play around with your running Mm. whether it be the intensity the volume the frequency lots and lots of things and in most cases get on top of it yeah Yeah. so so for someone with lateral hip pain and i say this quite a lot with it with achilles tendinopathy if we're thinking them very similar where they're probably not going to like faster running so even if you look at just modifying the intensity and you can do that so many different ways from sunday you can Mm. take it all out you can just uh, spread it out between three times a week you could halve it by 50 percent, or you could take it out completely and you could reduce the volume you can reduce Kills, yeah elevation. increase the frequency yeah. so and how how often do you see this exact example of mm. people that have come in months down the track where they had a little bit of pain initially and yeah. then they they stopped running completely for two or three weeks and it started to feel better great mm started running again and it's it's there straight away so this isn't i I would suggest that well the people that i see and i guess that's a a bias because i probably don't see the people that that gets better so there would be people that have time off for sure and then they start running again and they feel better but they don't come and see me so Mm. i guess that i'm biased in that way but they there's it's common to hear that they've had time off and they start again and it's sore as soon as they start doing something again and Mm. i think it's because they haven't expose that structure or that tendon or that bursa to the loading at an appropriate level Mm. for it to adapt positively and for it to desensitize to that particular stimulus yeah and even when you're training with pain you are still getting an adaption like your your threshold for tolerance if you can run 50 kilometers a week with a one out of 10 achilles pain and you continue to do that and it's not getting any worse your Achilles tendon is obviously tolerating that because we know that pain can be the, re- the result of, of many things. So if if that is the case, you can pretty pretty easily change some things. You certainly can have some time off, but the reason that we generally get people not to is because over that period, you can have some form of deconditioning. It's very likely that when you start back up again, if it's not guided by someone, you just ramp up and then it flares up again or it ends up being worse than before. If you are having some time off, just focusing on doing some good, whether it be bone or tendon or general running related specific movements in that time off to keep some load on that structure and then building back in. One of the the other things was just listening to the weekly recap of like doing a really hard speed session on one of the days and then the next morning getting up and going for a run. So a good example where intensity is very likely to irritate most lower limb running injuries whether it be tendons or or even compressive injuries and then not giving it more than 24 hours or 48 hours rest it's just going to build on that area not all already being recovered mm, yeah so i think with that you can almost and i wonder if if education on that if you were to get a thousand runners together might be a good idea for a study a thousand runners together and just run through a brief 20 minute education piece on that how would injury incidents change do you think it would change much if you would just give the basics of that injury incidents would change but maybe their maybe i've used the wrong word to run through them i suppose or to load Mm. manage more effectively or be able to self-manage their niggles maybe Mm. yeah Yeah. I'm, i'm big are you are you when you're in the clinic are you really putting in a lot of effort into the education because yeah i mean i'm not explaining to people too much yeah sometimes <laughs> i've been i've been trying to dial it back a little bit and almost sp- spread it out over sessions lately 
Yeah, I need to because do Because I think I'm, do more I, I have my bias is to give too much and I probably get too, it's probably too overwhelming. Yeah. That, this is what I'm speaking about because you always get your notes done and I do not. Mm. And I, I did, maybe I just, I really enjoy that that connection and that relationship you build with someone where in the last five minutes, I'm, I, I probably could, and I maybe need to get better at that is just turn and, and kind of do my notes at the same time. But I just love, and maybe to my own detriment, I really love sitting there and explaining and I'm drawing stuff and they're taking pictures and I'm telling them why I'm doing it. Like for an runner, as an example, I said to someone that the other day that, and they were wanting to hear that information. I, I think, you know, the, the risk of having this Achilles tendinopathy, again, is a little bit higher and you have a couple of risk factors, which we know from the research would suggest that that is the case. So what we want to try and do is is work on you having such a great understanding in case things do flare up again or something else happens, you're able to self-manage better. And if not, you know, you can always come you back to... You can still do that in a to 25 minute time slot. I mean, you mm. don't have to, like that doesn't have to go over, you know, to 35 minutes. You can just no, 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 not, not saying running multiple sessions. And, and the other part of it is you see people less frequently than I do. So I've got, I, I have the opportunity to have these conversations at, on different consults opposed to, you know, sometimes you're seeing people six weeks apart when you're doing reviews and things. I would say the, no, I would say the same as you a week or two weeks. Well, I think you just need to get better at your time management mm. then. Yeah, no, I'm not saying I'm running late. I mean, just purely for notes. Yeah, no. So if I've got a 30 minute gap, what, what I'm saying yeah, is know, like if I'm sitting there. It takes one minute to write your notes. If, but series. if you're, so if you're sitting there, all my attention is on you. I'm yeah, not. I'm not writing notes at the time anyway. So mm. we've, had, we've talked about this on the podcast. Yeah. I don't do any notes while I'm con- like when I'm talking Cons- with a consulting. person, unless it's just to write down like what their things. quad strength was or what their training schedule is, mm. things like that. But or the the year that they were had their fusion or whatever it was, like <laughs> they're not the mm. things that I will remember the specifics. Yeah. Oh yeah. But, at the start, I mean at the like yeah, at, the, at the very end, which I do need to, and sometimes I'll jot a couple I, I of things down. Like, I'll, I'll send them off. To like early maybe a couple minutes like <sighs> two minutes Four early seconds. and then i'll write my notes quickly and then yeah. bring the next person in maybe it's that bit i just i can't i struggle going from them walking out i might have a minute to spare and then going You're straight into writing in any scenario <laughs> oh like any, no no anytime we go to leave any kind of event oh yeah it takes way longer than it should because then you'll just like spark up this new conversation with someone when we're about to leave and i think you just need to wrap it up you mm. know it's just it's, <laughs> it's what gives me it really is what gives I'm, me energy and I, I have this conversation with justin him and i are very similar where just like we you know how some people and he was the first person to make make me aware of this some people walk away and this isn't rightly or wrongly some people walk away from a conversation where it drains their energy they feel very deflated not the center they've had a bad conversation they just feel like oh that took a lot whereas i feel as owen so does justin i walk away from something and i'm like holy shit that was freaking awesome i just talked to that guy about this or that or we just did this podcast and i'm like i'm freaking like i'll we'll finish this and i'll be excited like i just i love to have that that dialogue that yeah, that speaking because I think More I truly, extroverted. I just, I don't know if it's extroverted. I just, I truly believe that this format of speaking is the only way forward in anything that we want to be good at. Like I believe that you can think of things yourself, but speaking with people out loud, the right people. Which is why I was so keen to rehash the things that I learned from the Congress because I feel like that's just such a good way for me to yeah. remember the things that I learned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you want to uh, go yeah, for a next, point because we just talked point. about um, pain and we talked about case study. I've only got two more to go. Oh, two more. Then dinner time. Yeah. Then dinner time. Okay. Yeah, this one's going to be a bit of a long Oh, time. wait. I don't want to cut no, you off. No, no, I just no, wanted no, to no. give a shout out to uh, Jimmy Reed from Port mm-hmm. Mac, greatest half marathon runner in Australia. And good job, Jimmy. And Zach from Next Gen Physio in, in Newcastle. I know they, they listen. I know there's plenty of people that listen, but um, I've chatted Big to them. Shout out. Yeah. I want to give a shout out to Professor Sophia Nymphius. Oh, who I've yes. probably butchered oh, her last name. No, that's how you pronounce her, Prof. Sof. She is the, the coolest boss. person in the world, mm. honestly. Actually, 
second coolest, Madison D. Rosario, who is a para athlete um, of the marathon. She is the coolest person in the world. Where's Taylor Swift on that? So she's, second. she's, well, who would you rather meet her or Taylor Tay, Swift? Probably yeah. Taylor. Yeah. Um, but from the, from a learning point of view and clinical side of things, these, these two women. I I reckon Taylor knows a way around a bone stress injury. (laughs) So Sophia was one of the key note speakers and she was amazing. So the, the main point that she was sort of driving is that there is a difference between sex and gender. So what women often, I guess, not not get blamed, but are criticised for not being as athletic and not adapting as quickly and not mm. recovering as well and not being as strong and as fast as, as men. She was sort of arguing that a lot of those issues are more gender-based problems rather than <clears throat> sex differences. Do you yep. understand what the differences to that would be? I guess so sex, sex would difference. be biological, gender would be a social construct yeah, and exactly. social norms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So she was... Uh, so, for example, one of the studies that she referenced, which I thought was just really cool, and it's quite funny about how this study got approved through ethics, there was babies that were... Um, perched onto a platform and the there was a slope that they were encouraged to crawl down mm. and the the degree of the slope was gradually increased and so they were monitoring between males and females so comparing between the the girls and the boy babies mm. which um, at which degree would they stop crawling down the slope because they yeah. perceived it to be do- too dangerous and at the same time or not the same time prior they asked their their mothers how what what degree do you think that the babies will stop at? And mm-hmm. so all of the mothers that had girls underestimated how mm. steep the slope would be. And then all the mothers that had boys overestimated how steep the slope would be. And none of them were accurate, but mm. it's just an interesting perception that starts from a very early age and with our... Um, parents guidance and input and influence and things like that i think that's really fascinating it is but she was saying that uh, so so differences being like training history our environment the context training age all of those sorts of things that are influencing our ability to um, excel in our particular sport so one of the really fascinating things is that a lot of the youth development programs for a particular sport begins at 13 years of age. Mm. Now, it, it probably needs to be beginning pre-puberty, which it is, which that is for but boys, just. but not, not for women at all. So it would need to be beginning around the age of like 10 or maybe even 8 for, mm. for women or girls to be considered pre-puberty. And the reason for that is because there's such a high dropout rate of sport for in women and that's because our bodies change, we start to get our periods, mm. um, body hair starts to develop, self-consciousness, social pressures, all of those sorts Your of front, things. Your frontal lobe develops earlier in females. Yeah, yeah. So the, and the habit formation is another part of it. Mm. So, But then if the, the youth development programs aren't starting for until 13 years for women, that's almost too late. And so then what happens is they're, they're, and, and on, in addition to that, sorry, their overall volume of training across that time period between mm. 13 to 18 is a lot less than males. So they're not getting as much of a stimulus and developing as robust of a training history as males. And then when they reach 18 years old, there's a really steep increase to, to get up to the level, like the standard of yeah. play that they're being exposed to. And so that's why the risk of injuries is probably a lot higher, particularly in ACL injuries is the really common thing or the very talked about thing at the moment in women. But I was, that's what I was talking to Bo about recently. We were talk, talking about the possibility of that in bone stress injuries maybe mm. as well. And then on that note as well, so another really interesting fact which ties into that is, so one of the risk factors for ACL injuries is having a posterior, a higher posterior tibial slope. Mm. That's a biomechanical risk factor that might predispose someone to developing a bone stress injury, uh, sorry, an ACL rupture. So, but then there's studies that looks at rats. It's So it's in rats, disclosure. Mm. And there was a group of rats that did 
bike riding or cycling or running on a wheel or something like that that had resistance and then there was a group of rats that did it without resistance and the groups that did it with resistance or and that had a higher sort of stimulus to their to their bones and to Mm. their ligaments Mm. that posterior slope decrease so it actually became Mm. flatter opposed to the rats that didn't so Mm. how much translation that has to humans not sure Mm. but it almost implies that maybe if women had a an adequate training volume from the appropriate pre-puberty age Mm. at the volume equal to men and at the intensity equal to to men then maybe things would be different in the way of ACL injuries in particular, which is considered an epidemic at the moment. Mm. But it's it's probably, it should have been, like you should see it coming, like the, the rise in women's sport and then the, the circumstances that women have had, it's not particularly mm. surprising. Going, going back to what we've spoken about before, pushing for this to, to grow and to move more. I mean, if we talk about the progression and the rate at which it's moving, if you look at it from both ends, I mean, one can't change without the other, it seems. So at a youth level, that needs to change, mm. but that won't come to fruition for a really long time until they're, let's say theoretically, that's the sole thing you're looking at. Youth development and having exposure to lots of different stimuluses all the way up until the 20s and 25s and 30 age bracket when they're playing at a professional level. So whatever we implement now we won't truly know until it's that stage anyway because if we're talking about tissues they take a long time to adapt well yeah i guess what you so it needs to be so the eight-year-olds the little eight-year-olds now Mm. need to go into their youth development programs and then we Mm. need to monitor those eight-year-olds in i don't know however long which takes a long time see or 20 20 years and see if it's changed anything in the way of injuries and yeah Yeah. and look there's other things that influence it like the standard of play has increased drastically in afl like the rules have changed even Mm. so there's there's a lot of other things that come into play but i think you know uh trying to develop their athletes athletes well is is probably a very pivotal part well the basis of this for evolution that's why i enjoy reading Mm. books about evolution and and these kind of philosophical thing is like the selfish gene from like richard dawkins talking about nature versus nurture for every biological tissue that there is and i guess the 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 nature part is looking at the genetics of females and seeing how that differs and that's what you're talking about you know changes in the body are vastly different for males through you know puberty but also 30 40 you know pre and post menopause versus the nurture which is the environment that they're in Mm. it's very very hard to be able to single out one person and look at all those factors and see as a percentage you know if some people are potentially nurtures playing a bigger role than nature but i think it is a step in the right direction even if we find that there's no difference at least we know that there is no difference or it's not something to focus on it needs to to happen because as you said and as we all know the research percentage of females included is quite low but it's only going to improve Mm. i just don't know how quick it needs to happen because there's barriers to that happening so quickly and there's also harmful things that are happening so quickly well, I think we've got a really good basis to grow off. I mean, there's hundreds yeah. of years worth of research that's been conducted on men. So we can almost uh, fast track a lot of the research because we, we can see what hasn't been effective that's been carried out in studies on males in the, in the realm mm. of performance anyways. And so maybe we can get some results or answers a bit quicker. Yeah. It's funny when you were speaking about that just before... The amount of... I see a lot of severs. Lots and lots of severs. Tractional apophysitis of the calc. When I think back to the cases... If I think back to the last 10 cases, I think they all would have been males. They're all young boys. I, I really cannot think... I, I've definitely seen cases with females, but it is really boys that I have seen. I, I can't think seeing too many young girls with severs cases, which is just a thought that come into my, come yeah, into my head. Yeah, whether... Like what do you what do you pipe? What's your hypothesis there? I don't know what the hypothetical is. It just yeah. usually, and I, I remember doing. I did a presentation for the foot and ankle show over in the UK, like a webinar, and I remember reading a study, and I'd have to find it that that showed there was no association with being more active because the the idea is if you use your heel more, whether it be from compressive load underneath or tractional. Uh, pull on the, the Achilles and the growth plate. If you do that more, potentially your risk of severity is going to be higher. But mm. 
I remember reading a study and then they looked at a, a bunch of kids and there was no association with activity levels and servers, but logically it doesn't uh, make too much sense. But anyway, you had any, any more points? Yeah, I've got one last thing to, to say and it yeah. won't be for very long, but I think it's just an interesting point. So Chris uh, Kirsty Elliott Sale, she's a professor from Manchester University, another one of the keynote speakers who was incredible and learn a lot from her. Mm. She was talking about, so her main area is on the like ovarian hormones. Yeah. And she was just talking about how the menstrual cycle is, is quite a hype at the moment. It is. And it's it's a pet peeve of hers because she was just saying that it's only one component of the ovarian hormone profile that also encompasses a lot of other things. So 50% of athletes are taking some sort of hormonal contraception yep. and 50% of athletes are not taking any co- contraception. So that would be the people female. that are... female. Female, yep. yeah. That would be the people that are getting a menstrual cycle. So the there's a big hype about only 50% of athletes women female athletes mm. really and then there's yeah the contraceptive users there's people that are going through menopause yeah there's people that are perimenopause then there's people that have not got a period at all there's other things that you can be um talking about in the way of like their overall like well-being and other symptoms and signs and levels like um mm. signs of health as a a female and Yeah, I just thought that was a really interesting point. Like, why are we so concerned about the menstrual cycle and why aren't we, why are we neglecting to cover all of these other facets of, um, that make up a a woman? I think that the idea of the menstrual cycle and understanding what happens on a cellular level and a physiological level, it makes me think, so if I'm a male, which I am a male, I think, if I'm from the outside and I'm looking at, and I know this purely from conversations with you, and I, I just find, I find things like menopause and I find things about the mental cycle very interesting just because it's the human body and I find that interesting. If I was looking at that and I see all these changes that are happening and we know how much of an influence that has on the body, to me that seems like, well, it's only logical that we should be able to or we should have some change around our training or potentially there will be something that comes from the research that's what i see and think but obviously that doesn't seem to be the case well yeah so she was saying that there there's no high quality evidence to suggest phase-based training at the yeah. moment it's what about this phase-based life well that she was sort of say, saying the best thing that you can do is monitor your symptoms and pattern recognize mm. so yeah for me, I, I know that I don't feel as great in the week leading up to my period. And then the day that I get it, I start to feel really, really good. And that's mm. a pattern that I've recognized over the last two years of tracking my Wait, say that cycle. again. You what? You. What? You've... You. I feel good the day I get it. Yeah. Why are you laughing? I'm not. I'm just <laughs> thinking of this joke. One of the boys said the other day. It's really funny. <laughs> anyway. What? Tell no, me. I was, well, well, you and I are on. We're both on the... The Femi running app. I'm on the, the Femi running app is a an app for females that um that give you a running plan and you have to log your cycle and stuff. So I've synced us up. Yeah, so I'm on the same one. So I'm in my what are we? We're in our luteal phase. We're in our luteal phase. So I I mean that's. I'm looking forward to the full. Yeah, but But not because that's what I've been told. It's because what I've identified mm. as being a a point in my cycle that I feel better. Which is the pattern recognition. Yeah, but the app is. So, well, I was just going to say, like, the the concern is that people will read, oh, I should be feeling good in my follicular phase and bad in my luteal phase, and then they're going to be unnecessarily making changes when maybe they don't need to. So each woman is very individual in Mm. the symptoms that they might experience. So they might not have to adapt or change their training. Yeah, I think the the app is cool. I've been reading about it because it gives you a little spill about what's happening in your, mm. your body. And I think the idea of being able to journal and say how you're feeling. And it, I mean, it might be as simple as you're just doing an RPE at the end of the day or at the end of a training session and just seeing how that behaves at what place you are in your cycle. And I just think that's cool because that gives you that pattern recognition. Yeah. I never thought I'd be speaking about the menstrual cycle on a podcast in all my years of, of practice yeah. but, but here and we are you've been looking your symptoms too yeah. there you go yeah like, and it is it is interesting yeah. to see because i and this is 
Uh, I've read, I've read both of Stacey Sims' books. One, so one is raw, and the other one is on the menstrual cycle and no, menopause. <clears throat> menopause, sorry, not the menstrual cycle on, on menopause. And the the start of the book, you know, it, it just speaks to the the public perception mm. of what happens to a female's body. And if you you read the book, like they quote news articles, they quote statements being put out by like the American Medical Association and it was really just thought of as like this is women's problems just kind of deal with it on your own and we yeah. don't really know and like people are having symptoms it's really affecting people's lives mm. and doctors and people that they're talking about like yeah just kind of deal with it on your own that's a it's a woman's problem yeah, and yeah. Hush, hush. yeah and there's these real changes going on and there's things that we can do about it but a lot of the information and just the support wasn't wasn't there and i don't know it just doesn't it has never sat right with me like i speak to to patients about menopause to a very low level and i recommend that they go and speak to other people who are who i trust and People are just so shocked when mm. I speak about it. I'm like, yeah, that that could potentially be, or these things can happen with your body, and that could be a potential contributor. This is who should go and speak about it. And I've got to say, it feels pretty amazing to have people say, I've never had someone tell me this, or I just feel like you've really listened to me. And I have the same experience when I see people with hypermobility or connective tissue disorders. And I'm like, yeah, some of these symptoms are, are normal for what is happening in your body. And this is why, yeah. and this is how we can potentially help. And it's not your fault or the fact that you haven't been compliant with your, your rehab. Yeah. And that's that's so rewarding. And that's purely from, and the podcast has played a huge role in that, it's but that's cool, just from hey, seeking out that information. I was wondering about this too, because even you know on Friday, I was like, wow, this is really becoming a lot less taboo. Like we're talking about what it feels like when there's blood leaking out for, when we're on our yeah, period, yeah. when you're playing a sport, like, and yeah. it's, it, it was just so easy to have those conversations. And I was like, maybe that's just the circle that I'm in. Like maybe it's mm. not as openly discussed as it was in that room, for instance. But yeah, I wonder if sometimes we get a bit stuck in our bubbles, but I hope, I hope not. I hope it is becoming a bit less taboo and a bit yeah. more talked about. I believe one of the main reasons is just a lack of understanding and, and knowledge. Mm. So if you're not, I mean, comfortable, yes, but if you don't understand what you're talking about, it's very hard to then give give advice and the confidence obviously shows. Like I, I spoke to someone about leakage the other day uh, that was doing some, we were managing it, so bilateral and sertional Achilles and we were, uh, sorry, unilateral, one was a heel pain on the other side, uh, unilateral and we're just doing some, some double jumps and we had spoken about some, uh, this person was late, late 40s and they told me they were seeing someone <clears throat> Uh, women's health and they were, they were going kind of through menopause and I was like yeah great you know I've you know got an alright understanding of that these are some of the things that we, we may consider with your rehab and this is you know may be what it means with your fatigue levels or potentially it might not be this straight linear equation and, and so forth and doing some, some double jumping like oh I don't know sometimes I struggle with doing this I was like oh is it pain is it function and then talk about that leak and I was like oh great that's okay I completely understand that told that, you know, we've done a podcast with, with Caitlin Daly and I've got an all right understanding of that and this is what we're going to do to change that and you need to follow that up with your your physio and it was so that's easy so to speak about because I was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, yeah. it, it happens and I felt like they felt so comfortable even to say that. And, well, yeah, they would. Yeah. Actually, one of the, the conversations that we had on Friday was on that and the there was a consensus statement about navigating urinary incontinence and... Mm. I'll, I'll just say this quickly and then we'll wrap things up for today. But she, the consensus was that women are, are happy to have a conversation with anyone, male or female, as long as they feel, they are empathetic and they mm. are confident in giving, you know, their appropriate level of advice mm. and recommending the appropriate person that they should be discussing it yep. in further lengths with. So, and that was the ma overall majority of women had like stated that. So it's, it's good. Like I think, sure. and yeah, it doesn't just need to be a woman that's having that conversation. And as long as you're going into that topic with empathy and you're understanding where you're coming from and why you're having the conversation, then a woman's going to really appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I, I had this conversation every every day multiple times a day not about heart leakage and and menstrual cycles and, and menopause but speaking about footwear so footwear plays a huge role to influence the internal external loads upon the foot which in turn can help someone's pain and function so i'm talking about shoes all the time with people 
one of the barriers to people wanting to wear shoes is to look understandably, and we both fit into that category, trying to find a nice looking, comfortable, characteristic appropriate shoe can sometimes be a struggle for both males and and females so i'm constantly telling people and having these conversations like i I really understand what you mean where you don't want to wear this big ugly orthopedic shoe and i certainly don't want you to wear that so showing people that i do understand where they're coming from i think i've got a little bit of i guess a bit more confidence Mm. because i speak about shoes all the time and i'm like hey i wouldn't want to wear this ugly thing let's look at some shoes that you like and i i always say Please tell me from the start if you don't like it because there's plenty out there. Yeah. And I really want you to, to understand that we're going to find the shoe and I know that you want to look nice when you go out for lunch or go out for dinner and you don't want to wear this big, ugly, soft jogger. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the factors on there. Well, thank you all for tuning in to episode 100. Yeah. Triple digits, we've made it. This and is it. that was a really fun episode. I enjoyed recording that. So hopefully you all did too. So yeah, and thank thank you, listeners. We yeah. we really appreciate it. I mean, we've made plenty of connections. We've provided lots of I'm going to say good education and good advice because a lot of you have stuck around, which is great. And we hope to continue to do this forever. Kelly and I were saying, hopefully, when we're like 45 years old, we're going. Oh, who have we got this Saturday for the <laughs> podcast? So uh, we'll hopefully welcome still... to episode 3,749 yeah, of the sports if we medicine. Just, if we project. keep going, we'll speak to everyone, and then we'll just have to. And then we'll go like, great. We'll just start back and, start and go back again. again. Imagine speaking and speaking and imagine speaking to like Rich Willie in ten years or something like that. Who like the questions are going to be? Everyone's like, so what is a bone stress injury? For the next time it's going to be like. We've yeah. just spent 10 how years. How do we spice this up? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me on this molecular level if this happens and how does that consult? <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you very much. We'll speak to you all in a couple of weeks. We'll be back with a guest and it will be us again, return guest for episode 101, but we will have a, a very special guest again. Enjoy. Have a lovely week.